Hello, everybody. Good evening. Hello and welcome to Eastern State Penitentiary and to our Searchlight series. I'm very excited that Ann Parsons is joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Annie Anderson. I'm the manager of research and public programming here at Eastern State Penitentiary. How many of you have been to Eastern State before? Wow, okay, almost all of you. Well, welcome back. For those of you who have never been here before, I'm gonna give a brief overview of our programming um, and then talk a little bit about the historic site and then introduce Ann. Uh, we are currently sitting in the center surveillance hub of Eastern State Penitentiary, um, the world's first true penitentiary designed to inspire penitence or true regret in the hearts of, of its inhabitants. Eastern State opened in 1829 on farmland just outside of Philadelphia. Um, it was the first prison to practice solitary confinement and the first, uh, again, built on this idea of penitence. Its radial plan architecture uh, influenced the design of over 300 prisons around the world, uh, including prisons in Mexico, this one in Mexico City, in England, this is, a, this is Pentonville in London, England, in Manchester, England. And if you play the video game SimCity and you ask the game to design a prison for you, they will create this prison for you, which looks a lot like Eastern State Penitentiary. Uh, prisoners were kept in strict solitary confinement when the prison first opened in the 1800s. They were taught a trade. This is a prisoner caning a chair in his solitary confinement cell. The idea was that if you taught people a trade and you isolated them, they would reform, um, become penitent, um, and be able to, to make an honest living when they left the penitentiary after they had finished serving their sentence. We think that about 80,000 men, women, and children were incarcerated uh, over the course of the prison's 142-year history in this building. In the early 1900s, the prison shifted to a congregate model. This is a picture of the prison's basketball team. Folks were allowed to gather for work and worship, sports and leisure activities. This is a picture of a bunch of a group of guards standing by the front gate. Um, wardens even lived in the front administration building that you all came through tonight on your way in, up to this event. And there were concerts and radio broadcasts in this very center surveillance hub. This is from the mid 1900s in this very center surveillance hub. Folks gathered here for an event, much like we're gathered here tonight. Um, the prison was open from 1829 until 1970. It was closed and abandoned for 20 years before becoming a museum and historic site. And today we're open every day for tours. Most of our visitors access the site via a self-guided audio tour, but we have a robust lineup of group um, and guide-led tours and school groups and so forth. Uh, more and more, uh, Eastern State is engaging with our visitors around issues of contemporary justice. Um, this is our big graph installation. It's a 16 foot tall, uh, multi-ton infographic sculpture showing the absolute explosion in the prison population over the past 50 years. And every visitor who comes to Eastern State encounters the big graph on a group uh, or a self-guided tour. Um, the big graph was built to spark dialogue. Um, we ask our visitors, how would you like to see the prison system change by the year 2020? And we do have space to build an additional bar onto the big graph. In 2016, we opened a companion exhibit called Prisons Today, Questions in the Age of Mass Incarceration. It investigates the policies that have driven mass incarceration, the people impacted by prisons, and the consequences of a criminal conviction. It's really meant to humanize the issue of mass incarceration um, and to spark empathy and to build dialogue with our visitors. We ask our visitors, have you ever, ever broken the law and why are there so many Americans in prison? Um, we wanna get visitors thinking and reflecting on their own relationship to the criminal justice system. System. So even as we have tackled some more contemporary contentious issues, our attendance has continued to rise. And um, in 2018, we reached just over 275,000 annual daytime visitors. So what's up for Eastern State um, in the near future? We are building a new visitor center with modern restrooms and um, uh, contemporary uh, visitor amenities. The irony of this building is that it had flush toilets before the White House even did, but today visitors have to use a restroom trailer. So this new visitor center will be a major improvement in terms of visitor amenities. If you are interested in learning more about how you can support our programming, um, some folks from our membership team are here and you can chat with them at the reception following Anne's talk. Um, members support our programming here and help to keep events like our Searchlight series free. 
Um, in the really immediate near future, we are um, working on an exhibition called Hidden Lives Illuminated. We've spent the past nine months or so teaching screenwriting, animation, and filmmaking inside of two local prisons. And our students are making short animated films, which will then be projected onto the exterior facade of Eastern State um, for 30 nights in August and September of 2019. And if you want a sneak peek at the behind the scenes process of building Hidden Lives Illuminated, uh, we're actually devoting our July Searchlight event to this project. You can come back and hear from Sean Kelly, who is our director of interpretation here, and he's been the project lead on Hidden Lives. William Wallace, one of our teaching artists, and Mandy Quinn, who works with the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. They'll be discussing the challenges and successes of teaching storytelling and filmmaking inside of active prisons. So I hope you'll come back for that. That's Tuesday, July 2. So that event and Anne's event tonight are all both part of the Searchlight series. It's always the first Tuesday of every month. It's always 6 to 7 p.m. It's always free. There's always a reception to follow. And I think you got a little survey card when you came in. If, you can, if you're interested, you can sign up to receive our Searchlight emails and give us feedback on this event. We really do read those cards and tweak our programs based on your feedback. Um, tonight, I'm really excited that Anne has joined us um, and is going to be talking about her book, From Asylum to Prison, Deinstitutionalization and the Rise of Mass Incarceration After 1945. There will be some copies of Anne's book available at the reception, so if you want to purchase one, we're selling them credit card only, sorry, no cash, um, but I'm sure Anne would be happy to sign your book uh, if you purchase one at the reception. And I also wanted to know for accessibility purposes, Anne made some handouts of her presentation. So if you'd like a copy of them so you can follow along, you can just raise your hand and Lewis from our event team will bring you a copy of uh, her handout. So please join me in welcoming Anne Parsons. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sean, for uh, Sean Kelly for inviting me here tonight and for Annie Anderson um, for organizing this. Um, for me, it's a particular pri privilege. I think it was about seven years ago um, or so in July, a much hotter night than tonight. Um, I had given a talk um, here about the um, questions of haunting asylums and prisons and that kind of thing. And what, what does it mean when we make places haunted? Um, for me, it's a particular privilege coming now um, and being able to talk about my book um, seven years later, um, quite, a while, quite a while later. Um, I also wanted to thank all of you for coming out um, tonight. And I'm really hoping that this is both me sharing some about my book, but then really opening it up for a conversation um, about the issues that I raised. To be in Philadelphia talking about my book, which really is thinking about the history of prisons, where we have been in the past and where we're going in the future. For me, I can't um, begin without at least taking a moment of reflection that I um, worked here uh, in Philadelphia briefly after college at the ACLU of Pennsylvania. And there I worked with Stephen Presser and Larry Frankel, who are both two attorneys who did um, prison reform and um, worked around uh, trying to address racial bias in the police department. Both have since passed away. And so for me, this is, wonderful to be here, but their absence is met, is really felt. Um, and so I wanted to at least um, pause and, and address that. In the Eastern State Penitentiary Courtyard, people will see the big graph. Um, raise your hand if you've seen the big graph before, live, in person. I've pulled up a photograph on the screen. Um, the big graph is this big 3D bar graph, um, which puts into perspective how the United States has the highest rates of incarceration in the world. Um, at the top of the graph, um, it's there's one big red uh, uh, graph bar, bar at the end. Um, and at the top, it says the United States was around 760 people uh, out of every um, 100,000 people were incarcerated in 2010. The next highest is Rwanda, followed by Cuba, Georgia, Russia, but the United States um, dominates in this way. 
This carceral system disproportionately affects people of color, as many of us know, um, along with LGBTQ people, particularly trans people of color who are often um, arrested at higher numbers, and people with disabilities are overrepresented in the criminal justice system as well, with more than two-thirds of women in prison reporting psychiatric histories. Of course, as the historian in the room, this is my favorite part of the bar graph, which is the, the graph which shows the trajectory of the numbers over time. On the far left of the photo is, uh, begins in 1900, um, with the rate staying relatively low until 1970, the red bar. At that point, um, the numbers rise, I think the graph says 600% from roughly 1970 to 2010. To me, this history graph is so powerful for two main reasons. The first is that it really reflects for us a world without mass incarceration. For me, I was born in the 70s. Um, this is the only world that I've known um, with high prison rates. And this graph really shows us there's been this long history where actually the rates of imprisonment have been significantly lower in this country. The second thing that's really cool about this graph is that it begs the question, what will happen in 2020? As Annie pointed out, that's too, you know, it's going to come, but also 2030, 2040, 2050. Will these numbers plateau? Will they rise or will they drop dramatically like a roller coaster? What will, it, what will happen? And indeed, in many ways, it's up to many of us in this room and our society to figure out where we're going. According to Pew reports, the nation's incarceration rate has, in fact, begun to fall. And I know that that's the case um, in Philadelphia, some, and, and Pennsylvania as well. A decarceration movement has begun to gain steam um, as many states around the country have been looking to reduce their prison rates and cut costs and also have started to take up bipartisan efforts. Um, one example is the recent First Step Act, which was a bipartisan legislation of, at the federal level, trying to begin to reduce the rates of, imp of imprisonment. For me, in the early 2000s, I had the privilege of working on a decarceration campaign in Louisiana. Um, I worked as a youth prisons monitor and with the Juvenile Justice Project of Louisiana, we were seeking to decarcerate um, the youth prisons, the juvenile justice system there. At the time, Louisiana had the highest rates of youth imprisonment in the world. Um, and the organization took a multi-pronged approach to decarcerate its juvenile system. There were a few ways that, that we as the organization addressed it. One was um, advocacy, particularly by family um, and friends of kids who are incarcerated. I pulled up a photograph, um, which was a jazz funeral protest, one of many protests, um, which were campaigning to close the Tallulah Youth Prison in Louisiana. Um, so there was advocacy, activism. Another area was legislation. Um, the organization worked to lobby to get bills to pass, bills passed that were really trying to shift resources away from youth prisons and into community services for kids. The final thing was a lawsuit um, that really charged that the prison conditions had been unconstitutional and they needed to improve. The campaign was successful in many ways. So in less than a decade, the number of youth prisons went from six to two. The rates of youth imprisonment were cut to, to about one third of what they had once was, once were. And yet at the time, and also today, what deeply troubled me was how even as we were working to reduce the rates of incarceration for youth, there were conversations about how do we bring adults into the prison instead. So actually, one thing I just learned um, over the past couple of days is that one facility, the Gina Correctional Center for Youth, which we worked to close in 2001, um, was empty for a number of years and then actually was repurposed. It's now the largest ICE immigration detention center in Louisiana. Right? A number of other prisons, when I was looking into them, have also be, been repurposed often for um, adult use. That's been the core question for me of my research over the past decade, is how in this process of decarceration, of addressing 
high rates of incarceration, are there actually cycles of incarceration that have happened over time? So in this case, juvenile prisons have become adult prisons. And for me, as I would visit the prisons in Louisiana, I found that history had so much to teach us. The over-incarceration of African-American youth in Louisiana was rooted in the legacy of slavery and racism that's been so beautifully told in the book, The New Jim Crow, and the film, 13th, and the continued racism and xenophobia drive that imprisonment today. I did what any normal person would do, and I became a historian. So I ended up leaving a uh, nonprofit. My parents are here today. This was not a good career choice uh, in their minds. So. But what I really found was that it was so important to understand where we had been in order to really more effectively make change. In graduate school, I began studying the history of prisons. And as I dug into that history, I found that in the Northeast and Midwest in particular, many prisons had, in fact, once been mental health institutions. So for example, in Pennsylvania, there are a few prisons, SCI Waymart, SCI Retreat, SCI Crescent, all were once mental health institutions or on the lands of them. I pulled up two photographs here on the top is SCI Retreat. Um, which is in, uh, both of these are in um, the nor far northeast around Scranton. This is Wilkesboro, um, SCI Retreat, and then SCI Waymart was um, the Farview State Hospital. I had found that many of these institutions had already gone through their own decarceration, their own closure as mental health institutions. And then when I was studying these closures of mental health institutions, how that happened, it actually had a lot of reverberations for me of my experiences in Louisiana. And so that really ended up being the core question of the book um, and my research, which is what can we learn from the deinstitutionalization of mental hospitals from these closures? Sometimes you need a really good graph to bring it to life though, right? Huh. So Bernard Harcourt um, has, is a legal scholar who's also studied some of these questions. And he, um, he ended up looking at the rates of institutionalization and mental institutions in the United States. And so this is a graph that starts in the 1930s. And it, you can see that the numbers of people in mental hospitals and developmental centers peak in the 1950s at about 600 people per 100,000. This is still more, this is still almost comparable to the rates of imprisonment in 2010. Just to give you a sense of that, the number of people there. They begin dr dropping dramatically starting in the mid 1950s and get down to about 50 um, or less per 100,000 adults by 2000. The sociologist Andrew Skull wrote about this phenomenon, deinstitutionalization, and in writing about it, he actually termed, he coined the term decarceration. The, de the word decarceration comes from Andrew Skull um, writing about the deinstitutionalization of mental hospitals, and actually um, there was a shift towards potentially deinstitutionalizing prisons in the 60s and 70s. So over the, over the past 10 years or so, I've been studying this phenomena of deinstitutionalization as a decarceration movement, and what can we learn from it as we approach potentially decarcerating prisons today? I focused on none other than Pennsylvania, um, not just because it's a wonderful state. Usually, you know, if I'm in other places, I need to, you know, say why Pennsylvania. Here, I'm in Pennsylvania, so it's a privilege. Um, but Pennsylvania had um, one of the largest mental health systems in the country in the mid 20th century, and also Philadelphia is a center of medicine and disability rights activism and prisoners' rights activism. And so, it's a really great place to study these issues um, as they came before. I'd like to also say that for me, this book was not the last word on this topic by any stretch. Um, for me, it's really seeking to start a conversation. What can we learn from this? And I hope that I can do the same today, which is to share with you some of what I learned, but then really have a conversation among people in this room, many of whom may have lived through what I'm talking about, um, to really think about what are we learning from this um, and what are we taking forward.
I'm going to talk about one story in particular, um, which is the closure of mental health institutions under Governor Dick Thornburg in, in the 1980s. I pulled up a photograph of Dick Thornburg um, standing next to, standing with some of his family, um, standing next to a son, and then his wife, his second wife, Ginny, sitting, um, sitting on a chair next to the younger son. Thornburg's story really interested me in part because it's a complicated history of deinstitutionalization. To me, often it's talked in, in terms that are black and white. It was good, it was bad, should it have happened, should it have not. But in fact, it was an incredibly co complicated process. There's a new book, A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Tolls, and in it, he compares um, history to being a kaleidoscope, right? It's not history isn't a series of facts, but instead a kaleidoscope. And that as you're slowly shifting it, the beads are changing so that you don't notice the change when it's happening. And it's this much more complicated process. In many ways, that's how I've found this history to be, is this much more complicated process. In Thornburg's case, he was the governor of a state with one of the largest mental health systems in the 80s. He was a fiscal conservative, but he was also the father of a son with a disability. So he had a personal connection to reducing this reliance on institutionalism. When Peter, his son, became school age, doctors encouraged Dick and his second wife, Ginny, to place him in an institution, and they decided not to. In the 1960s, conceptions of intellectual disability were changing, and more and more parents were refuting the social stigma that went with it, and were, were questioning whether or not to put their children in institutions. Instead, they placed Peter in public school, which was really not set up to serve students with disabilities at that time. And so it really drove Ginny Thornburg to become a major advocate in um, disability rights. Both before she became the governor's wife and also during, the gov um, during his governorship, um, Ginny ended up visiting a number of facilities for people with disabilities. This is a photograph of her visiting the School for the Deaf in the 80s. Um, she also visited developmental centers in Pennsylvania like the Polk Center. And there she often found terrible conditions. One example that was really stood out in her mind in an oral history is that she went in and she found that there weren't barriers between the toilets and there were also not seats on the toilets either for the children there. What she found was a real dehumanization for many of the kids who were in institutions and people who were in the institutions. And that really ended up driving much of her advocacy and informing her husband's work. They were also connected with the ARC, which was a national organization um, for many, many of whom were family members who advocated for the rights of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And by the 1970s, the ARC had become a, become a driving force for the closure of these large institutions. Ginny and Dick, and Dick Thornburg were both associated with the ARC, um, particularly Ginny, um, and that anti-institutionalism ended up really informing some of the policies. In 1978, Thornburg ran for governor of Pennsylvania as a moderate conservative who espoused, quote, the individual, the free enterprise system, fiscal responsibility, and strong state and local governments. He won, and after taking office, his primary focus became the state deficit. He balanced the budget not by raising taxes, but by reducing government spending, which included cuts to social services. A second major initiative that I found is that was his work to downsize state mental health institutions, to really move away from this institutional model in mental health and focus more on community-based services. Here, Thornburg was not acting alone. He was acting as part of a much broader national trend of deinstitutionalization that had begun in the 1950s and was really a perfect storm of social, cultural, and political changes. In the general culture, many critiques of mental hospitals um, had been emerging starting in the 60s. And here I brought up a slide with just a few books that, that came out in, a in just a small um, period, Irving Goffman's Asylums, Thomas Zaz's The Myth of Mental Illness, Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which later beca became the film. All of these really changed the way that people thought of institutions. 
we really began to think of them more as restrictive and potentially oppressive rather than healing spaces. They came out at the same time that there were major changes in psychiatry. The introduction of major drugs such as Thorazine changed the landscape in psychiatry. And there was also a new faith in local psychiatrists to cure mental health conditions um, in communities rather than these far off removed hospitals. A major moment there was the 1963 Community Mental Health Act um, signed by Kennedy a few weeks before he died, which provided federal funding for new community mental health centers. Interestingly, when Kennedy signed this act and when he gave a speech, he envisioned a world in the future um, where they had cut the mental health population down by 50%, right? So now we talk about a world in the future. That was the world that he was envisioning. Federal legislation like Medicare also hastened deinstitutionalization as many elderly people in hospitals began to be served in nursing homes rather than state hospitals. And finally, the disability rights movement began to grow in the 60s, and activists increasingly argued against the institutionalization of people with disabilities. Again, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania becomes central here with the Pennhurst State School lawsuit. Um, this is a historic marker from Pennhurst, um, which discusses how between 1980 and 1980, 19, 1908 and 1987, more than 10,000 people with developmental disabilities were at Pennhurst. Um, there were major lawsuits that were brought um, that ended up being argued before the Supreme Court that led to the institution's closure. And quote, groundbreaking advocacy and new public policy, including transition to community-based living, made Pennhurst a milestone in the disability civil rights movement. Pennhurst and many other lawsuits and cases ended up really shifting this, um, shifting society away from an institutional model and more towards a community-based one. It's also important to acknowledge the work of psychiatric survivors in deinstitutionalization too. One organization that was active in the 70s that did a lot of organizing was the Alliance for the Liberation of Mental Patients, um, which was active here in Philadelphia, which argued that people should not be locked up in mental hospitals, argued against um, coercion in medical treatment. Um, this is actually a mimeographed, um, a mimeographed copy. It's the only copy left um, that I've been able to find from the Alliance of, uh, for the Liberation of Mental Patients in um, the Temple Archives. It's actually in the Prisoner's Rights um, Collection. There's a Prisoner's Rights Council, um, and it had been, a copy had been sent to them, and they kept their papers. There are no remaining papers of, this, of the Alliance. If anyone knows um, of anyone connected, please let us know, you know, let me know. Um, but they ended up um, being very active along with, and um, along with a number of civil liberties attorneys, some of whom are in Philadelphia, working to overturn laws that allowed the courts to commit people to mental hospitals against their will. Instead, people had to be found dangerous to themselves or others. So historians love giving context, and I've just given a lot of context. I'm going to return to Dick Thornburg. The idea there is that Thornburg wasn't operating alone, um, that he brought his own personal interests and commitment to this issue, but also was um, entered it into a context where much had been changing in mental health. There had been a title shift in mental health since the 1950s. When he came into office, he really ended up working to close mental health institutions in Pennsylvania. Already in the 60s and 70s, many mental health institutions have been downsizing or shrinking, um, but here, here he was really looking to shut some of them down um, and to consolidate the system. He publicly shared his son Peter's story um, and argued that the two main priorities for change were one, quote, destroying the stereotypes that inhibit us from seeing individual people with particular needs, and two, proper living arrangements so that individuals can, quote, live in their own homes and neighborhoods rather than institutions. Retreat State Hospital was one of the first institutions to come under Thornburg's knife. Um, the hospital operated um, uh, near Wilkesboro, which was an anthracite coal mining town, um, and it came under scrutiny 
in large part um, because it was relatively small, 300 people. And also, if you can see from the photograph, or I'll point out from the photograph, um, behind the hospital was a mountain, and in front of it was a river. It was accessible for many decades only by barge. Um, so when you talk about the remoteness of many of these hospitals, they literally, it, it embodied that um, remoteness. Retreat also was not meeting Medicare um, compliance requirements at that time, and so it was going to take a big investment of money to get it up to code. Um, in this time of cost cutting, that was not going to happen, and so instead, Thornburg proposed shutting it down. Immediately, his plan to close retreat met with opposition from people in that area. I've pulled up a few headlines um, that say protesters berate governor, call for veto to save retreat, um, letters to the editor about the benefits that retreat offers, and then a mayor and coalition were opposing the retreat closure. The area had suffered from deindustrialization of coal um, since World War II, and many people were struggling to survive. So the loss of that hospital really would be another loss to their economy. The AFSCME government uh, workers union representing the retreat employees ended up also opposing the closure, um, in part because of the representation of the workers and their jobs, but also they were arguing that the closure was going to hurt people in the hospital themselves. AFSCME ended up being a major force against these cuts to social services in the 1980s that were happening on a much broader level. On the other side, the ARC of Pennsylvania, the Mental Health Association, the Pennsylvania Psychiatric Society all ended up supporting Thornburg in the closure, and in the end, um, retreat did close. During Thornburg, Thornburg's years in office, the Department of Welfare reduced the number of in-state mental health institutions by 34% and closed no less than 10 facilities by 1986. So really there was this real shift um, during that time to close places. It is important to note though that also Thornburg's administration did end up putting money into independent living centers and attending care programs. And so for the first time during his administration, there was more money spent on community care than money for institutions. But still the money wasn't enough. Um, I was finding numerous letters from um, the Mental Health Association to the Thornburg administration um, during this time in saying that they needed more money, particularly for people with serious mental health conditions for housing, employment, income supports. There are many people being released from hospitals that couldn't find these, um, that couldn't sustain themselves. And so these were really, they were key. The second core problem with this decarceration in mental health was that at the same time that hospitals were closing, um, prisons were building. And so another powerful graph that Bernard, Bernard Harcourt ended up creating um, is one that's a little harder to read. Um, so I'll walk us through it. Um, the, uh, the middle, it's kind of a long, I wonder, I'm supposed to stay near the podium, but I'm going to leave. Oh, the, middle, the middle line um, is the rate of people in mental hospitals, right? mental health institutions. And the lower line, the bottom line, is the number of people in prisons. And you can see mental hospitals go up and then down significantly. Uh, but the number of people in prison really stay relatively low. And then in the 1970s, skyrocket at the same time. That's exactly what happened here in Pennsylvania, and that's exactly what happened in the 1980s under Thornburg. Um, here, the Farview State Hospital brings this to life, particularly. Um, I'm, I'm pulling up a, a series that was done, the Farview findings in the Philadelphia Inquirer in 1976 um, by, by um, Asel Moore and Wendell Rawls. Um, they ended up exposing conditions at the Farview State Hospital for the criminally insane. Um, it was a hospital that was for people uh, who were either in prisons um, with mental health conditions and were being sent to Farview, or they were in hospitals and found to be dangerous, um, and so they were sent to Farview. Farview held a disproportionate number of African-American men, um, and in 1976, a man, Stonewall Jackson, um, ended up being killed um, because of abuse there at Farview. Um, 
Asel Moore ended up digging into the case and exposing conditions in a series that ended up winning a Pulitzer Prize. Um, and under Governor Schapp in the 70s, the administration and the state decided to close Farview down. It was too abusive. When Governor Thornburg came into office, though, he reversed course and ultimately decided to keep Farview open, spending millions to renovate it. So there's the question. It doesn't quite make sense why, during a time of closing so many mental hospitals, would he have closed his administration, have sought to keep Farview open? Implicit in this plan was the idea that individuals with serious mental health conditions who committed crimes did not deserve um, this community care. I mean, that's ultimately at the base, a question of who can be in the community and who cannot, and how danger plays um, a role in that. The other important context here is Thornburg's war on crime in 1981. Um, he had been a prosecutor um, and he announced publicly in the early 80s that the criminal justice budget was, quote, designed to put fear to work for people and to put punks and thugs and pushers firmly within the walls of a prison. At that time, Pennsylvania's crime rates were rising, but still Pennsylvania had the sixth lowest crime rates in the country in 1980. As part of this war on crime, Thornburg ended up um, uh, passing a $112, um, $112 million government bond um, for about 2,700 new um, prison beds, um, and also implementing a number of sentencing reforms um, and mandatory minimums. This was lar part of a larger tough on crime movement nationwide, and there are a number of wonderful books that have come out recently about this. Um, by Julie Kohler Hausman and Elizabeth Kai Hinton, and I'd really um, recommend them. Uh, ultimately, President Johnson's war on crime in the 1960s had started leading to the rise of both policing and imprisonment in the 60s, and Nixon and Reagan's war on drugs were part of this tough on crime stance that Thornburg's um, initiative was part of. Ultimately, though, history is still complicated, and I feel it's important to point out that when I was going through the documents in the archives and the documents of Thornburg's policymakers that he was working with, they also had graphs, and some of their graphs were imagining the future. And so I saw graphs that showed um, the rates of imprisonment in the 80s and 90s going up as a result of um, the mandatory minimum sentencing, but then a vision of starting in the late 90s, the aughts, ultimately prison rates going down and both crime and prison rates going down. Um, the idea there was that, that the mandatory minimum sentencing will be a hard punitive approach that would address crime. Historians are ult the ultimate Monday morning quarterbacks, right? You know, we never deal with games that are ongoing right now. It's always about what has happened in the past and us trying to understand what happened. For us, hindsight is 2020. Um, and so we know now that those long sentences did not lead to fewer people in prison, um, but instead um, the prison rates rose in Pennsylvania from less than 8,000 people to about 50,000 people um, in 2010. Again, this was an age of cost cutting. And so Thorn the Thornburg administration is faced with how to um, end up justifying some of the cost for building prisons. And one of the main ways that um, came about was the possibility of converting mental hospitals into prisons. Um, so this is where I found that a number of mental hospitals, um, the land, buildings, and or workforces ended up being repurposed into prisons during this time. A few years ago, I visited both SCI Retreat and SCI Waymart, and I was having lunch and talking with some of the staff there, and they were commenting that to them, the place had, places had really come full circle. They had both once been mental hospitals, and now they were prisons with substantial mental health units. And they couldn't get, you know, this sense that there had been this circular um, movement in history. Over the past few years, Pennsylvania has been experiencing its own decarceration efforts. Um, I've been reading some about. And in 2017, as part of a decline in prisons, politicians were looking at um, potential prisons to shut down. Two of the prisons that it started to look at were SCI Waymart and SCI Retreat. 
Um, when it was proposed that they may be one of the prisons to be shut down, there was major protest from the community, as there was um, in the 80s. Protests that there would be significant loss of jobs um, and money, but also that they served important roles as prisons with significant mental health units. In the end, both of those prisons stayed open. For me, the more I learn, the more I learn how much I don't know, right? So I share all of this um, as really, you know, trying to share what I've been finding in the archives, what I've been learning, but then really to start a conversation um, here and um, on a larger scale that as we consider decarceration today, how can we look at this longer history, not just in, in prisons, but also in, um, in mental health, in the history of asylums, um, in other areas, too, to understand our longtime reliance on custodial institutions in this country. So I, what I wanted to do now was just offer a few thoughts on some lessons that I took from this um, and then really open it up for a Q&A of discussion, both questions for me, but then also a discussion among um, the audience. So some takeaways that I've had from this work. The first is that multi-pronged approaches often make change possible. The cultural critiques of hospitals from books like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, paired with activist organizing, bipartisan legislation, all were able to reduce our reliance on mental health institutions, large-scale custodial institutions over time. And that today, the confluence of cultural works, books, documentaries, along with activism and legislation can also make change. I also really learned from the Thornburg story, and I've learned from many others too, that it's so important for the people directly affected by these systems, by the mental health and criminal legal systems, um, to, be, to get involved and for policymakers to listen to them and their opinions on making change. And also, I've learned from the failings of deinstitutionalization. In many ways, the closure of mental hospitals did reduce the number of beds in custodial institutions, but it often didn't bring about an equitable system of care. It often didn't address the racism and implicit bias in psychiatry and the criminal legal system. And many people with mental health conditions were criminalized and incarcerated as hospitals closed. Decarceration is not also just about cutting costs. It's also about addressing the underlying issues of racism, poverty, the school to prison pipeline to make real change. Here, the possibilities of working to shift resources out of prisons and into communities is, is in many ways similarly aligned to that community mental health vision from the 60s. And then finally, the economic concerns of, com of communities that hold prisons are critical. One reason it's been so hard to close retreat and far view is local opposition. In, er in the early 2000s, I worked um, on the campaign, as I talked about before, to close youth prisons and Tallulah um, Correctional Center for Youth was one of them. And I've included a small photograph of Tallulah on the bottom right corner of the slide, and it says um, Louisiana Technical College Tallulah Campus. Um, in the case of Tallulah, we didn't just work to close the prison, but we ended up working um, to pass an economic stimulus package to that area, and Tallulah ended up being converted into a community college. For me, I'm, really, I'm incredibly hopeful as I reflect on Tallulah and see the possibilities of moving away from custodial institutions and potentially breaking this cycle. As a historian, um, and particularly a historian who's now off of social media um, and dreams of the days when we had flip phones, right? I often <laughs> grapple with, you know, be, feeling like a relic of the past or grapple with being outdated to my students. Um, but in this case, I am hopeful that 50 years from now in 2069, our children in that future generation will look back on this era of mass incarceration as outdated, as a relic of the past. I can only hope ultimately that there are more Eastern state penitentiaries where we're sitting in more empty prisons across the country and discussing how to make a better future. A future 
that's one, the center's inclusivity and where more money is spent on education, health and social services than prisons. I look forward to speaking with you in this conversation and thank you. Yeah, with unintended consequences. That's a wonderful question, and that actually is um, yes. I'll re that's that's a lot to repeat. Okay, so I'll bre I will try, but forgive me in the meantime um, for. So his question is, um, as the number of people in mental hospitals dropped and the number of people um, in prisons, the rates of imprisonment rose, is that raising a question that ultimately, you know, there's um, some types of behaviors that are leading to this constant institutionalization or like, you know, uh, social issues that are not being addressed? Um, I'm wording that terribly, um, but I do have to say that that actually is one of the issues that Bernard Harcourt um, was looking at, was looking at, okay, what are rates of crime or how, um, uh, how have things changed? Um, one of the responses I have to that is that um, there has been successful deinstitutionalization in a number of um, European countries that have not seen the same dramatic rise in imprisonment. Right. And so um, this question of, you know, are these are there cycles of um, institutions that one will go down and another will come up? Um, I think the European model offers an alternative, which is that um, uh, more focus on um, uh, more focus on trying to reduce restrictive environments and increase rehabilitation or a more rehabilitative approach um, actually could be more and decriminalizing just to kind of reducing sentences having much you know much lower sentences um, are important so that's one thought but I should say that that's a question that a number of scholars have actually been chewing over um, and then the second question is about um, the current reforms than today and unintended, unintended consequences. I do think that, you know, for me, much of my work is trying to get us to think about um, as we're taking these steps and in Philadelphia, I think there are efforts to reduce the rates of incarceration over the past few years with MacArthur funds I was reading and um, uh, around bail particularly and that kind of thing, trying to think about um, what are other forms that might arise. And I know, for instance, in some cities, um, there's not 
things like bail have been um, replaced in some ways by more increased surveillance. Um, and there's been proposals of e-carceration, which means digital surveillance, um, ankle monitors, inc increased probation and parole. And many prison reform advocates are questioning, you know, will this be a new form um, of surveillance, of imprisonment at home um, that we need to be cognizant of? So, um, but they're good questions. Thank you. Yeah. Somewhat related to this, um, I don't know the exact percentage of land you talked mm -hmm. through, but I know it's high, the percentage of people who are incarcerated who have mental health issues. And then the other question I had or concern I had is one of the pushes for decarceration is that we have a lot of elderly prisoners who are costing us a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm concerned, so what happens when we release all these elderly prisoners mm -hmm. who have been locked up for decades? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, are we going to have the resources that they're going to have? Mm -hmm. I'm concerned mm -hmm. that we won't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I just thought of when you said, mentioned decarceration, mm -hmm. of one of the problems with that is they're making the people who wear those ankle monitors pay for those ankle monitors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just to repeat um, a few of what was just said, one was the added piece around e-carceration, which is that many people are paying for ankle monitors. Um, and I also want to add, I knew um, a man um, uh, in Chicago who got out of prison and he went to his mom's home and he ended up um, having an ankle bracelet and was on parole. And he found it actually worse than being in prison because he felt he was putting his mom's life at risk for him individually. This is everyone, but they're real complicated um, of, um, that are important to consider. And this is often why it's so important to really try to involve affected in trying to make change. Um, in terms of the n the other question which you raised, which is so important, um, there is a higher rate of people with serious mental health conditions um, who are arrested and imprisoned. Um, and so there's been a rise recently of um, mental health courts, drug courts, often um, substance abuse is comorbid with um, mental health conditions. Um, so mental health courts and drug courts um, have their own set of problems, but that has been one way that people have been trying to work to reduce in, to reduce incarceration and try to shift people away from just being sent to jail, um, but instead um, into treatment programs. There's certainly not the be all end all, but um, that's been one, you know, one strategy. Um, and then the final question is around um, elderly prisons, which is. Um, not a topic I'm as familiar with, but I think discussions of decarceration are not as much about kind of just suddenly releasing people and letting them go. Instead, it's more about trying to think through what do, um, what are the sentencing measures that we have? What are reentry programs? Questions of bail, questions of, um, so I, that said, if there's anyone in the room who is more knowledgeable about issues around elderly prisoners, because my sense is that this is a real issue in the criminal justice system right now. So, yes. Is low at this point. Yeah, um, I'll just repeat that just because of the room and the 
I'll try to repeat it. Sorry. Um, just um, she was pointing out that there's a new geriatric unit in um, at SEI Muncie, the women's prison, um, and um, recently it's been getting you know it's large enough that they're also hiring women who are there at the prison to be caregivers at, at the place. But it's um, some of the women have been there for decades, um, and it really raises this question of how to um, are there ways to try to try to return them to their communities, particularly is there very low risk um, of reoffending at this point? Yes. So how do we, I guess, take into account the privatization of prison and police being this mm -hmm. kind of explode since the eighties? And I mean, you're the expert, I don't remember there being mm -hmm. such a level of privatization, I guess in like institutionalization in like the fifties. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, she was point. She was raising the issue, which is totally on point, which is that in the 1970s, 1980s, in deinstitutionalization, um, they were not facing the issue of privatization of private prisons, of mental health services, food services, be medical services being outsourced to private companies, and that is exactly you're hitting the nail on the head. One thing I find in deinstitutionalization is that's not you have government workers unions, um, but you do not have the privatization. You know the. You do not have firms or companies lobbying to keep um, uh, lobbying against legislation um, and getting involved in social welfare policy in the way that today so many private prison firms are getting involved in policy making that in a democracy is ultimately for the people to decide, right? To determine how as a society we run ourselves. And ultimately many private prisons have major stakes. Um, for me, the Gina facility was built by a private prison firm and then was um, renovated by a private prison firm, continues to be run by private prison firms. And um, many private um, prison companies get um, involved in um, lobbying in the legislation. I think um, Heather, Tom Heather Ann Thompson, who wrote a recent book on Attica, gave a talk on this and, and what she said rang true to me. The question of private prisons ultimately raises a real question about our democracy in terms of thinking about criminal justice policy, social, po social welfare policy, how we are governing ourselves, um, and whether or not there should be private interests at stake. Um, yes? There, those of us who lived through it thought that if Ginny Thornburg had been governor, there might have been a chance of success. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the governor we had believed in the individual, the free enterprise system, fiscal responsibility, and strong state and local governments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of course it wouldn't work. And then mm -hmm. he pandered to put pumps and thugs, mm -hmm. the quote we use, mm -hmm. in jail. Mm -hmm. So how could he possibly have succeeded? Mm -hmm. He didn't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that true? <laughs> <laughs> um, it is true, and I, uh, well, I mean, you know, I don't know about Ginny or um, Dick, although I think that she, I do think that um, I ask myself often then, so what? So is it then totally simple? And so the so what to me in that situation is what is the um, world in which we're living today, in which the Trump administration has recently um, passed the First Step Act legislation. And I've been asked many times as a historian, should we trust it or should we not? And the story of Thornburg really raises these issues that it's hard to pass sentencing reforms. The First Step Act was trying to um, make it easier for some federal prisoners to leave and was trying to take some steps for sentencing. The issue there is um, that it's not just about 
the sentencing changes or changing one thing. It really has to be a more complete picture. Um, and for me, that was what I took from, Thorn from Thornburg. Um, so in what you're saying, in that, you know, it's, it, the institutionalization was in many ways doomed to fail in just focusing on trying to reduce beds without adequately addressing the underlying needs of the community, which included access to medical care, access to housing, employment, that kind of thing. Um, those are my thoughts, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, yeah. I don't mean to add to the hopelessness, but I was, I was also just, I mean, this question of census and keeping prison beds full. Um, I was wondering in 2017, there was this effort to close down a few prisons in Pennsylvania. So I was wondering, okay, well, what's happening now in the past couple of months? Um, have any prisons been closed? And I found um, that there's a, there was a move now, and maybe and someone else here knows about this, to actually move, um, uh, prisoners from another state into prison. So Delaware, actually, I originally come from Delaware. Um, uh, it's actually looking, okay, can we fill some of the beds um, through bringing in prisoners, not by closing down the prisons, but bringing them from other places. Um, yeah. Well, greater for? I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh okay. Excuse me. Sorry. I apologize. I get too chat. I get chatty. Um, so it's a little after seven. Thank you all again for coming out. There's a reception, I assume, back there. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. I'm, I'm sorry to cut off such a great conversation, but Anne will be at the reception. If you have more questions, please feel free to chat with her at the reception. Thank you so much for coming.